webinar, insights from interviews with farmers using reduced drench. It looks like we have a great level of interest, so thank you for your time and support. I'm Dr. Susie Keeling, and I'm the Sector Science Strategy Manager for Beef and Lamb. And along with my team, we look after Beef and Lamb's research, and I'll be tonight's host for the webinar. Before we kick off, I would like to thank and acknowledge Cara Brosnahan, our Senior Advisor Research Programs, who managed this research project. Cara will be collating your questions ready for the Q&A session after the panel discussion. I'd also like to thank Olivia Weatherburn, National Extension Program Manager, who is taking care of the technical aspects of the webinar behind the scenes. So that everyone has a sense for what to expect tonight, here is a brief overview of the plan. I will cover the project origins before handing over to two of our guests to take you through the interviews with farmers who are using minimal or reduced drench. We are fortunate to have both Anne Riddler and Karen Hitton from Massey University with us tonight. For those that don't know, Anne Riddler is an Associate Professor of Sheep and Beef Cattle Health and Production at the School of Veterinary Science. She teaches sheep and beef cattle health to vet and animal science students, and also undertakes research into various aspects of sheep health and production. Karen Hitton is a lecturer in, in the Environmental Management School of Agriculture and Environment at Massey University. Karen teaches both undergrad and postgraduate courses in environmental management and also undertakes research exploring the social dimensions of a wide range of environmental issues. Anne and Karen will then be joined by Ginny Dodunsky, who is our WormWise Program Manager. Many of you will know Ginny, but for those of you that don't, Ginny is a veterinarian who in 2022 left many years of rural practice to focus solely on helping New Zealand sheep and beef farmers with some of their biggest challenges. Ginny now spends half of each week managing the WormWise program for Beef and Lamb New Zealand and the rest of the week doing private consultancy work. Her interests centre around farm systems, breeding new management, practical parasitology, deer and dairy sheep. So after we've had the presentation from the Massey team and then we'll have a panel discussion which will take us about 10 or 15 minutes, we'll then move on to question and answer session. So during the panel discussion and the presentation, it would be great if everybody can submit questions in the chat and I'll explain to you how you do that in a minute. We'll then aim to finish at about 10 to eight and work towards our wrap up. And also during the wrap up, it'll be great if everybody can provide some feedback on the webinar tonight. So in terms of Zoom interaction, for those of you that aren't all that familiar with Zoom, what you will notice typically down the bottom of your screen is a little icon that um, refers to the chat. So this is in the meeting controls um, part of the, of the Zoom functions. So in the, the two box, there'll be a drop down menu where you can select that you're going to send your question or your comment or your feedback to everybody. I advise that you don't send it to me because I won't be monitoring uh, the messages or the chats that come through. And once you're happy with your question or your comment or your feedback, you then simply need to hit enter and your message will be sent through uh, to Cara who will be compiling everything in the background. So, and for just for clarity um, and to also, I guess, accommodate some of the challenges of rural broadband, we ask that you keep your audio and camera off um, during tonight's webinar. So if we move on to project origins, um, one of the things that you know, the research team has been doing over the last few years is thinking about how can we um, better support farmers when it comes to parasite management and drench resistance. And that sentiment is certainly supported by farmers who consistently tell us that it's one of their most significant animal health priorities. But it's quite evident that more drench is not the answer. But then that led us, led us to two potential questions that we needed to generate some information for. So the first one was thinking about, is successful farming with reduced drench possible? And the second was around what influences behaviours and habits for farmers who have chosen this path. And the most obvious approach for, th for this was to ask some farmers. And that is exactly what this project is about. Now, before I hand over to Anne, 
I'd like to pass on a huge thanks to the farmers who have been involved in their project, in this project. We're really appreciative of their time, their expertise and the knowledge that they have provided us to help make this project a success. So I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Anne and Karen to, to take us through the project. Thanks, Susie. So I will share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, so Susie's um, outlined the background for this project. So in terms of the aims, Karen and I were wanting to interview farmers with low or reduced drench, so whose parasite management strategy involved that, um, to firstly understand the why. So what was it that motivated these farmers to go down that reduced drench pathway and how do they make their parasite management decisions? And secondly, we wanted to understand the how. What does their parent parasite management strategy involve to facilitate or allow that reduced drench use? What are their operational processes? So Karen and I visited 17 farms throughout New Zealand. Um, as you can see from the map here, we had three each from the northern, northern and central South Island and southern regions of New Zealand and four farms each in the western and eastern regions. 16 of the farms had sheep and beef cattle and one was beef cattle only. Our farm sizes were quite variable in size. Um, they ranged from 260 to 2,500 effective hectares with an average of 1,150 effective hectares. And the farm systems themselves were really variable. So within both the sheep and the beef cattle systems, the were, as a, there was a mix of some or all of breeding, finishing, trading and stud operations. So some of these farms were really quite complex. Um, two of the farms had fine wool breed sheep two were intensive bull beef farms um, and a couple were running dairy heifer grazers as well. So the farmers that we interviewed had varied priorities and uh, philosophies of farming, but some really clear themes emerged from all the farmers that we spoke to, including wanting to feed stock well, being proactive about animal health and the importance of paying attention to detail. Five of the farmers described their philosophy of farming in terms of wanting to farm resilient animals that are well suited to their environment. And some of the farmers emphasised that for them, productivity is secondary to other goals such as sustainability and work-life balance. In contrast, some others describe themselves as highly competitive and production oriented. For example, one farmer characterised their farming philosophy as pedal hard down, intensive and aggressive. Seven of the farmers had had um, drench um, resistance diagnosed in their sheep system, and this was the primary driver for changes in parasite control, including reducing drench use. For the remaining 10 farms, the motivations for reducing drench varied. All the farmers were aware about the issue of drench resistance and concern that it may emerge on their farm in the future was certainly a factor contributing to several farmers' decision to reduce drench use. Uh, five farmers also mentioned that broader desire to breed and farm more resilient animals well suited to their environment, while some farmers' desire to use less drench was associated with the goal of using less chemical inputs on their farm more broadly. Workload and costs were also raised as motivating factors by some of the farmers. Um, farmers describe using a really wide range of different sources of information about parasite management. So all 17 farmers identified vets as an important source of information. And farmers from eight farms also identified scientists as a source of information that they used. Seven farmers referred to Wormwise workshops and the Wormwise website. And rural newspapers, farmer discussion groups and the internet were also identified. Um, some farmers believe there's plenty of information available but many argued that there's not enough or that the information that is out there can be confusing, conflicting or contain mixed messages. Um, in terms of making decisions about um, drench use, we found that the farmers really varied in their decision-making processes. Some collaborated really closely with their vet or other animal health advisor. Um, meeting with them regularly and having in-depth discussions regarding all aspects of parasite management. Um, and these um, farmers really made decisions collaboratively with a high level of communication and trust. 
At the other end of the spectrum, we talked to farmers who were making their decisions about parasite management independently. They gathered information about parasite management from a wide range of sources. Um, often their vet was one of these sources, but had minimal, if any, direct input into making those decisions. So when it comes to the how or farmers, how farmers were um, running their low or reduced drench system, a really standout theme was the importance of monitoring. And it was really clear when we were talking to the farmers that with their monitoring, they were taking multiple factors into account when they were making decisions. So they weren't making decisions based on a single or one or two pieces of information. They were taking a whole bunch of factors into account. And the thing that really stood out most strongly in terms of monitoring was observation or stockmanship. So all the farmers talked about how they prided themselves on their stockmanship or observational skills or how observation and monitoring animals was really important to their system. Um, within the sheep systems, particularly within young sheep, faecal egg counts were um, used on, on pretty much all the farms, um, either occasionally or frequently, um, or farmers had used them in the past, and with that information, they now felt that they had a pretty good handle on what was happening with parasites on their farm. Live weight and body condition score were also used, but there wasn't a big emphasis on these. So I've got a quote here, which I think encapsulates really nicely that sort of multi-factor decision-making that I've described. So this farm is talking about their monitoring and they're saying that they're taking into account, you know, weather history, paddock history, a little bit of fecal leak out testing, what sort of feed the animals have been on. So, you know, what you expect the sort of growth rates they should be doing, how they look. So, you know, just emphasizing that again, that monitor, that observation, really important, but also taking lots of, lots of things into account when making those decisions. Fifteen hundred kilograms as the lowest that they want to graze lambs down to. Um, cross grazing, so either with alternate species or with older animals of the same species, were also highlighted. So having you know grazing systems that ensured that there was high levels of cross um, grazing or that was in, all integrated to um, re reduce larval contamination. And for some farmers, rotational grazing and frequent shifts were also emphasised. So again, I've got a quote which I think encapsulates that quite nicely. So this farm is talking about, you know, having a balanced sheep and cattle ratio, good rotational grazing and higher covers. And then they say feeding well is huge. Good conditioned stock can fight off more things than poor conditioned things that are struggling along. So just emphasising that, that, you know, that feeding well was, was a really strong theme. Of our 17 farmers, 11 of them were using crops either always or sometimes. Um, but for Virtually for most of them, the parasite control aspect of that was not a big priority. They were using crops to um, match feed supply and demand or to improve animal growth rates. Um, so only two farms were using crops specifically with a focus on parasite control, um, and they were both using rape or kale. 14 of our farms had breeding ewe flocks that bred their own replacements. And in six of those, they were had a genetic emphasis. So they were using um, maternal breed rams with, with parasite resistant genetics. Now all the farmers we interviewed did use some drench um, and different farmers had different approaches to their drenching and their reduction in drenching in different stock classes. So some farmers had mostly focused on reducing drench use in their ewe flock, some had focused more on reducing it in their lambs and others had reduced it in, in both. Um, it wasn't an all or nothing approach, you know, even some farmers that were trying to use very little drench in their ewes and in their lambs, like one for example was still regularly drenching their sale lambs because they didn't want to compromise the growth rates of those sale lambs and they figured the quicker they're off the farm, the less drench, drench inputs they needed. Um, just remembering as well that our farmers were at different stages of their reduced drench journey, some were fairly early in the piece and some have been doing it for, for many years. So within the ewes, about a third never drenched their ewes or only did so very rarely. Um, just over a third would only drench, you know, small numbers of low body condition score ewes from time to time. And in most cases, they would then either cull those ewes 
once they regained condition, or they would put them in a bee mob or a terminal mob and not breed replacements from them. However, 25% of them were still drenching some or all used pre-lamb, uh, mainly with short-acting products, and 1% or 6% was drenching tooths um, in late summer for Barber's Pole. With the lambs, um, all of our farmers were drenching their lambs at weaning, but then after weaning, one was drenching sort of every 28 to 30 days, so regularly to February. Just over a third were drenching regularly through to um, autumn, April, May, and the, the remainder, so 57%, were only drenching lambs on the basis of monitoring, and I've already talked about the sort of monitoring that, that was being used. Sorry. Um, okay, so in terms of approaches to cattle drenching, this was highly variable. Um, our cattle systems were quite variable anyway. Um, in general, with most of the more sort of semi-extensive cattle systems, drench use in cattle was, was fairly infrequent and it was mainly based on visual monitoring. We did have some intensive cattle systems here, though we had two um, intensive bull beef systems. We had steers being finished under pivots and we had dairy heifer grazers. And in those systems, they were sort of the, the reduction in drench use was, was either increasing the drench intervals um, to some degree, carefully, um, and or um, minimal drench in cattle that were older than about nine to 14 months. So really trying to tail off the drenching once those cattle got through to an age that, that they were getting a bit more robust towards parasites. Um, and these intensive systems also had a big focus on refugia. So none of the farmers we spoke to were able to provide detailed information regarding the financial impacts of farming with reduced drench inputs. In some cases, this was because they'd been farming in this way for a long period of time, so didn't have anything to compare their current performance with. In other cases, where farmers had more recently reduced their drench use, it was difficult to quantify the impact of this change because it was just one of many changes that they'd implemented, sometimes in a very short period of time. However, farmers on all 17 farms expressed positive views regarding the impacts of reduced drench use on their farms and argued that any negative short-term impacts that they had experienced were outweighed by the long-term benefits of reducing drench use. Some of the farmers were uh, confident that reducing drench use had had a positive financial impact on their farm, emphasising the reduced labour and animal health costs. Um, so the first quote uh, on the right of this slide uh, is a farmer explaining that I don't think there would have been a huge production cost or financial cost. You'd still be saving more than what you're spending. Some of the farmers did identify short term um, impacts, uh, but emphasised again that these were outweighed by the long term benefits. Um, the second quote on this slide is a farmer explaining that maybe we have lost a bit of production, but a long term plan is the one you've got to watch for. Farmers also described a range of other types of positive impacts, including animal health benefits, reduced workload, and a better work-life balance. So just to summarise, um, on the basis of these interviews, it seems fair to say that all farmers and farm systems have the potential to farm successfully with low or reduced drench use. So we interviewed 17 farms. Um, it's not a huge number, but they were in a diverse range of locations, farm sizes and, and systems. Um, and there was no one type of farmer that had chosen to go down this route. You know, they had varying farming philosophies and motivations and decision drivers. Um, and their reduced drench use was compatible with a range of farming objectives and goals. Based on the farmers we interviewed, to farm with reduced, reduced drench use, you know, it, it needs focused attention. So actually committing to applying some mental energy to it um, and then putting effort into that careful monitoring, thinking about feeding stock well and those other management things that I touched on. Um, also that ability to make decisions taking into account multiple factors um, is also, you know, came through as, as being really important. Um, and finally, integrating parasite control with farm and livestock management. So rather than have parasite control as a, as a kind of separate thing, um, that it's an integral part of, of how the farm is set up in the management that is happening on that farm. So I guess cross-grazing is a really nice example of, of what I mean by that. So I'd like to thank Beef and Lamb New Zealand for, or Karen and I, sorry, we would like to thank Beef and Lamb New Zealand for initiating this project, funding it, and providing input into the planning and review. Um, massive thanks to the participating farmers who were amazing um, and to the vets and advisors who helped identify those farmers. 
And we'd also like to thank Dave Lethwick, Ginny Dodunsky, Andy Greer, and Cara Brosnahan for their input into the planning stages. And so thank you, and I'll hand back to you, Susie. Yep, I think it's come back to me now. <laughs> Thanks, Anne, that was great. Karen and Ginny, are you all ready now? And we'll do the panel discussion. Excellent. Right. So I'll kick us off um, before we look at some of the questions that have come through in the chat. So Anne and Karen, like what were some of the highlights from actually doing this work? Um, I'll kick off for that. Um, I guess for me, it was actually really cool um, going to these farms, um, but also just the, the diversity and complexity of the farming systems and how, you know, there was a whole range of different types of farmers that were, were going, you know, achieving this reduced drench um, use and how it could be compatible with a range of farming philosophies and goals and objectives. How about you, Karen? Also, uh, just getting the opportunity to speak to the farmers. Um, they're incredibly generous with their time and really willing to take that time to share with us their knowledge and experience. I learned so much and I was really inspired by their passion and their commitment to taking on this challenge of farming with reduced drench. Yeah, no, it's just been amazing just to kind of, you know, see all the quotes coming through and just, you know, that kind of, you know, how, how they've just embraced it you know, and they've all kind of got, you know, those common goals and are working towards something you know, which they're hoping is going to be, you know, more sustainable for them in the future. And it's been really cool to see the project evolve. So, you know, we've sort of, you know, talked about some of the highlights. Were there any aspects of, you know, like the conversations with farmers that, you know, were unexpected or surprised you? Um, yeah, I guess, again, just, yeah, the, how, yeah, the different types of farmers just managing to achieve what they were doing. And, there's some very consistent themes, but all approaching it in a different way. I guess it was really cool as a sheep and beef pet. You know, I'm quite concerned about drench resistance and where our industry is going to be, you know, five, 10, 20 years time. Um, and it was pretty heartening to sort of, um, you know, see that, that farmers were taking this on and um, showcasing that it's actually realistic to be able to do this across a range of different systems. Any other comments from you, Karen? No? <laughs> Anne summed it up. Did she steal your words? <laughs> um, one of the things that we've sort of seen evolve more over the last few years in terms of, you know, the, the research that Beef and Lamb funds is thinking about, you know, the role of, of social science research. And it'd be really good, Karen, to, you know, for you to give us a bit of an explanation of social science research, but how it was incorporated into this project and how it's helped make it a success. Certainly. Um, so uh, social science is a really broad field of research and can involve many different things. But in general, it refers to taking a scientific approach to study social dimensions of issues or problems. And in this project, um, we took a mixed methods approach, which allowed us to collect both quantitative and qualitative data. So both information about things that can be quantified, how often farmers drench, which drenches they use and so on, um, as well as um, qualitative information about their motivations, their decision drivers, their decision making processes and so on. So we didn't want to make any assumptions coming into this about these factors. So our interview questions were very open-ended and really just allowed the farmers to tell us what was important to them, uh, both in terms of how they approach this challenge of farming with reduced range, but also why and what's driving them um, and what's helping them and enabling them and supporting them to do that successfully. Yeah, and I think capturing these types of information then makes it really useful in terms of how we think about our extension material going forward and how we need to tailor that in terms of thinking around motivators and drivers and challenges and, you know, making sure that, you know, the packages of information that we produce help, you know, cater for those different perspectives as well. So, you know, thanks for that, Karen. Um, often we hear that, you know, all farmers and their farms are different. And, you know, acknowledging that this study was, you know, certainly a small sample size, but, you know, very in-depth. Um, were there, you know, any common goals shared by the farmers that were interviewed? Yeah, you're, you're certainly right. The farms were really different in many different ways. Um, but all farmers shared this common desire or objective of reducing reliance on drench and avoiding, or in some cases where it had already been diagnosed, addressing drench resistance. 
Um, and as we discussed in the presentation, there are also some shared goals in terms of feeding stock well, um, being proactive, uh, taking a proactive approach to animal health and parasite management specifically, um, and the importance of paying attention to detail and really staying on top of the parasite management program. So they definitely viewed it more as an integrated component of their farm system rather than we just need to tackle parasites. It's how it links to everything else to do with, with animal health as well. Yep. So, so now, Jenny, you haven't completely escaped, um, but I will ask this question of everybody on the panel. But Jenny, if you wouldn't mind uh, answering first, um, what do you think are some of the most challenging aspects for farmers when it comes to parasite management? It's a nice, easy question. Sorry. <laughs> I think um, Dave Lethwick's got this, um, this term he uses called the drench gun jitters, and it's, it's getting confident enough um, to, to, to not pick up that drench gun um, when, when all the information that you've got in front of you says that you don't need to. Um, I think, you know, we have now farmed with regular anthelmintic use in sheep in particular and lambs in particular for you know, four decades or more now, um, and we are getting, you know, we, we sort of have a whole generation of, of people now who don't necessarily um, believe or think that that we can farm with a lot less drench, um, and yet there are, you know, wonderful examples out there all over the place of, of farms that, that do manage to do that. So I think it's a fear that there's a, there's a fear with a lot of animal health stuff about what will happen if you don't, you know, we give copper just in case we, we do this drench now just in case we do, um, you know, a pre-lamb treatment or a pre-tap treatment just in case because, you know, and I get it on, on big properties in particular when things go wrong, um, they can go wrong in a pretty big way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's as in, in, in Karen have said, you know, those things that come through in terms of feeding stock well, um, a lot of farmers had done monitoring, uh, quite intensive monitoring to begin with of faecal egg counts and then sort of got comfortable with what their eye was telling them around stock condition feed and all the other things and then backed off using so, so much egg count monitoring and things like that. So it's it's just getting, it's a whole new system to get comfortable with, right? Because um, none of the farms in this in this study were organic farmers or anyone that's, that was very fringe, the, the um, you know, standard kind of farming operations, but just doing it with less strength. Did that answer the question? That was great. Thanks, Jenny. Anne or Karen, do you have any further thoughts in terms of what are the most challenging aspects for farmers when it comes to parasite management? I definitely think the confusing and conflicting messages coming from different sources um, pose a challenge to some farmers, particularly farmers early in this early in the process of making changes. So was that around confusing published information or were they getting a combination of different messages from, you know, I guess different rural professionals or was it just kind of everything in general, you know? Um, both, in fact, yeah. yeah. Even from two different vets telling them completely different sort of yeah. things. Yeah, that's certainly hard to navigate when you've got, yeah, multiple sources of information and it, yeah, it's got varying levels of consistency between it. Definitely challenging. And do you have any thoughts? Uh, no, I think, um, yeah, I think what Jenny and, and Karen both said sums it up pretty nicely. Yeah. Great. So I guess one of my next questions is thinking around, you know, like you've considered all of these different farm systems. And based on, I guess, all of your collective expertise, do you think it's possible for most farm systems to, you know, re, you know, have some kind of you know, element of, you know, reducing their, you know, reliance or usage of of drench going forward? And and I guess the other aspect is, do you think that you know, perhaps the best approach to this is like a, a stepwise, kind of you know, a gradual sort of, you know, modification or integration into the animal health plan? Yeah. Keen to hear thoughts. I guess from the study point of view, as we've, we've already said, you know, we had a really diverse range of farmers, locations, systems, um, you know, what was happening on farms. So from that point of view, you know, we hear sometimes farmers say, oh, you know, that wouldn't work on my farm because, or whatever. Um, you know, we, we obviously didn't cover every single farm system, but I, I'm not sure that that's, that's true, um, that, you know, I think, I think it could be possible on, on any farm. Um, but it really does require a, a mental 
you know, a commitment, like applying some mental energy to it, having a plan, thinking through it, doing the research, um, et cetera. And then depending on, yeah, probably, as you say, Susie, a stepwise approach to it. So, you know, <laughs> the last thing we want, well, the last thing I, I would want, Jenny Margaret, is for people to go, oh, okay, I'll just pull back on drench and, and with nothing, no other changes, because that's that's probably not going to go well. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Ginny, actually, to maybe, if you want to talk around that as well, Ginny. Yeah, and we, I mean, we're already hearing and seeing of cases like that as we get triple drench resistance diagnosed on farms around the country where people have made no other management changes other than to stop, you know, just blanket stop using capsules in their use and then, you know, having disastrous results because of that. Um, to your question, Susie, about can any farm farm with reduced drench, I think any farm system in any location, that can be done, but it's actually due to, it's down to the people who are there. Um, and I would say, you know, for some, some people, mate, you know, no, you can't farm with reduced drench because your grass is never longer than that. And, um, you know, there is a particularly in terms of ewe drenching, there is a lot of ewe drenching that goes on in New Zealand that is, is a, a plug for poor nutrition or a plug for inadequate feed covers and inadequate body condition. Um, so if if people aren't prepared to to raise the bar on that stuff, um, then reducing drench use will fail and then those of us giving that advice will be blamed. Um, so you cannot have one without the other, in my opinion. Um, you've got to you've got to bring it along with um, with management changes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely important not to view you know, all those components in isolation. It's all about a systems approach, isn't it? Um, so you know, during I guess the presentation and you know some of the you know the, I guess the discussion so far, you know the importance of monitoring you know being you know discussed. Um, what were the main tools that farmers used, and you know how do you think they can best use the tools that are currently available? Um, yeah, so I guess um, I, I sort of emphasised observation and stockmanship, and while I was talking, and that was something that came through really strongly from the farmers, and I don't personally know how you train those skills. Some people seem to be very good at observing animals and have a high level of stockmanship and others can go and shift a mob of sheep and, and not really notice anything. So um, yeah, um, but yeah, obviously, you know, regular monitoring, really knowing, understanding animals and taking those other factors into account. Um, Fecal lead counts, they're not perfect, you know, it'd be nice if we had a much better tool, but they're what we've got. Um, and I really think that, you know, even most farmers, drench sheep in the absence of hardly any information at all you know they don't really know what's going on so using faculty accounts to do do monitoring um particularly in young sheep you know really really useful um and so in this study you know for the young sheep in particular virtually all the farmers were either using them or had used them um and Obviously, if you've got a system that's quite efficient from a logistical point of view, that makes faecal accounts a lot more straightforward. But, you know, that they're, they're just providing information, which often we, we don't really have a lot of um, when it comes to parasite decisions. So. Cool. So we've got quite a few questions that have come through the chat. And, you know, what we've looked to do is to group ones that are quite similar. Um, so I'll attempt to work my way um, through them and see how we go. Um, and you probably remember this conversation, you know, that we had very early on in the project, which was around how did we define low drench and, you know, how was reduction quantified and whether or not that was based on comparing against what they had previously used or was it, you know, relevant to others in the region? Can you give a bit of an explanation about how we tried to come up with a definition? That, yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. We have, there's been no research in New Zealand really, um, certainly not for a long time, looking at what would be considered typical drench use in, in sheep or cattle. Um, so, you know, we couldn't look, at, we didn't have a, a population of all New Zealand farmers and know what their drench use is and then be able to select the ones with, with low drench use. Um, so what we did was contact vets and advisors that had a lot of experience in their area um, and asked them if they knew of farmers that had low or reduced drench use. So relative to other farms with similar systems in their practice area. Um, and most of them could only come up with one or two, if any. So, you know, it's not like they went, oh, yeah, we've got 50 farmers, you know, which one do you want? It was like, oh, yeah, I do actually know someone that that, that might fit that bill. Um, and then once we'd had permission to contact that farmer, I sort of did a brief 
discussion with them on their parasite control just to get an overview. Um, and then if it sounded like they had low relative to the, the small amount of work that's been done in New Zealand, we then asked if they would participate. So um, it's not a perfect system um, in terms of selection, but it was it was as good as we can get. And in looking at the results, you know, compared with I guess typical, well, what what we would consider to be probably typical drench use, you know, they were they were lower reduced. Um, and remembering that some of them were just starting their pathway, and others were were a long way down the down the pathway of reduced drench as well. So Anne, I think yeah, it's, something like yeah. sorry, sorry just go, Jenny. Um, you know, something like fifty was it fifty seven percent of the men only drenched lambs on monitoring. I mean, that's a big difference from the standard, you know, out there. Um, so in that one in particular, that's probably the most scariest in the the one where the wheels, you know, would be the quickest to fall off. So yeah, they're, they're definitely a different group. Yeah, and I didn't mention it, but, um, you know, only two of them routinely gave a pre-weaning drench, for example, whereas I think for a lot of farms, a pre-weaning drench would pretty much be a given. So, yeah, and, you know, some of them were drenching lambs routinely, but they weren't drenching the ewes and vice versa, you know, so we had a, we had a range of where they'd focused their reduced drench as well. Okay, so that's that's actually answered uh, two questions. So great job, team. <laughs> Just looking at the next one here. Um, so this one is possibly for you, Ginny. Um, did many of, did any or many reduce drench frequency for weaned lambs? And if so, this is a reference to Dave, have any comments on the risks of reduced drench use in lambs? And uh, I guess the comment that's followed is around, there seems to be some robust evidence for monthly preventative drenching and that is you know, aligned with Wormwise advice. So yeah, yeah I, I saw that in the chat. I've, I've had the chat sitting there, so I could, so I could be prepared for questions <laughs> like that. Um, yes. Um, so you know, the wormwise standard advice is if you're running lambs on contaminated pasture, that a 28 day drench interval is a safe option in terms of parasitism. I do think you know that 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 28 day drench stuff. You know, it comes from systems where there's a high percentage of sheep uh, using lamb sharing that grazing area together. Um, there are many, many systems though where uh, there may be more cattle um, in the system or lambs are on cleaner feed. Um, however, that cleaner feed is created. Um, it's a very, I, I think this is an area where each farm could do a lot more of their own monitoring and actually find out how quickly lambs are becoming reinfected because the 28 day drench interval, right? That's about the theoretical life cycle of the main parasites in, in optimal conditions takes about 21 days. So we've got that 21 day period where um, when you've drenched, um, there, are, there should be no eggs coming through. Um, and then you get some adult worms establishing and again at the end of 21 days. So you're giving a week um, for some unselected uh, worms to be in there and laying eggs. Um, what I find when I'm doing monitoring on my consultancy farms is that quite often at 28 days, lambs have got very low or, or even near zero egg counts on, on some of those feeds. And ev even on you know mixed farms where lambs are rotating around hill country where there's a lot of cattle in the system, um, I think there are probably quite a lot of farms out there drenching at 28 days that don't need to be. but but it is the safe option. Um, however, if you're always drenching at 28 days and there aren't actually that many worms managing to sneak back in to the system um, in between each drench in terms of unselected worms, I think you can, you know, I've seen some farms where that's what they do and I can't see any other um, risk factors for drench resistance and, and they've ended up with combination drench resistance. So again, it's, you know, to Anne's point about we do a lot of drenching with no information, um, this is this would be a really good opportunity for people to look more strongly at their own system. Sorry, that was a really long way of answering that question. That's <laughs> all good. Thanks, Jenny. Um, this one's probably more, I think, in your area, Karen. Um, so does the fact that we take so many factors into account before deciding what to do penalise our system or would it be considered a strength? Can I can I pass this to Anne? Ginny? Oh, Ginny, fair By play to you. Go for gold, mate. Yep. You can share the joy. <laughs> Yeah, I read I read that one as well and went, oh my God, I sat there thinking about that for like quite a long time while you were speaking and missed half of what you were saying. Um, I think, 
I think the point there was um, to not use one piece of information in isolation. And um, we certainly got into trouble way back when uh, we used to do, or talk about doing a thing called trigger drenching of lambs, where you know you would fecal egg count lambs until the average egg count got to a certain, usually 500 eggs per gram, and you wouldn't drench till then. Um, and that got a really bad name because farmers would find that we're waiting and waiting and waiting for these fecal egg counts to go up. And actually, the lambs look awful. And I really wish I'd drenched them two weeks ago. So it's it's I think it's a strength to answer that question because the more information you put into the decision, the less likely you are to rely on one thing and then make a bad decision because of it. Um, so if we're egg counting and the egg counts have shot up, well, you know, that's typically you will drench. But if, if we're egg counting and the egg counts are low, yet we don't like the look of the lambs or they're a bit slow in, in the northern half of the North Island, they, they might be a bit slow because they're getting barber's pole, even though the egg counts haven't gone up yet. So the, yeah, the more we take into that decision, I think the stronger it is. And I think as long as you're not using it um, as a way to, you know, we've got so much information, I can't possibly make a decision because there's too much information coming at me. Um, yeah, if, if, you're, yeah, if you feel overwhelmed with the information. <laughs> approach, doesn't it? And thinking about how you break break it down and start small. <laughs> and Yeah, yeah and, and I have, you know, you know I have seen people first. try to... Mm. I have seen people try to sort of make algorithms for drenching in terms of all the things that you take into account. And yeah, um, yes, you know, that can be helpful. But I think you've just you've got to use your common sense and your stockmanship as has been said so many times. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so this one is probably a slightly more operational question. Um, what was the targeted high residual that our study farms tried to achieve on bull beef finishing? That might be one for you, Anne. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if I can answer that off the top of my head either, I'm afraid. Um, okay. Yeah, you can always varies. provide a follow up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I might need to provide a follow up. Um, I think it varied a bit depending on the time of the year and I guess the grass growth and things. I think with those cell systems, you know, um, they're, they're quite challenging to run sometimes as well. So I'm going to follow up on that one. I'll defer. Um, I have been sneaking around talking to some of these farmers because I want to know what they're doing. <laughs> um, and yeah, one one of the only beef systems that I have talked to mentioned 15, 1600 um, and, and even higher sometimes for those young calves. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I wanted to say that, but then I didn't want to get it wrong. So yeah, because 15, 15, 14, 15 was, was what was talking about for lambs as well. Um, so okay. yeah, just really trying to be well above where those larvae, most of those larvae are residing. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about some of the testing that was being done, do you have a sense for how common the fecal egg reduction test was on these farms, as opposed to just the fecal egg count? Um, yeah, good question. So um, none of the cattle systems have done fecal egg count reduction tests, although two of them had done drench checks. Um, so checking the effects, you know, just checking after drenching or fecal counts after drenching. Within the sheep systems, there was one that had never done any drench efficacy testing. There was one that had just done drench checking and the rest had done it at least one faculty count reduction test within the last eight years. And I think four or five had done a faculty count reduction test within the last two or three years. So it was, yeah, it was quite mixed actually. And surprisingly, you know, some farmers hadn't done one for quite some time or not at all. And so the ones that had, were they using that information to inform their decision or was it more just out of interest? Um, it was, I guess, the ones that had, had diagnosed rent resistance that obviously um, used that to inform their yes. decision making in terms of in, what they were doing. Um, for the others, it was really just checking that things were, were on track. Yep. And then also basing their implementic choice on or drench choice on, on the results. Mm -hmm. And so in the study, like, did you identify um, the breeders of maternal size for each farm at all? I'm trying to remember if that was part of it. In terms of where they got their rams from? Yeah, so I guess the other comment that goes with that, I'll read the question out again. Um, did you identify the breeders of maternal size for each farm? Possibly those not actively selecting individual rams on that trait were still passively benefiting from their breeders' progress, question mark. Um, yeah, good question. So I sort of said that six were, were sort of, that was an important breeding objective for them. There was another three that purchased rams from studs that, that were breeding for parasite resistance, but it wasn't an important selection criteria for them. And for the others, they weren't, um, they, yeah, 
parasite resistance was not something that there was even in their um, interest. Well, you know, they weren't perfect purchasing rams. Yep. Resistant genetics. So we've got a comment inquiring about uh, stocking rates on these farms. Do you um, yep, I guess variable. Yep. <laughs> you know, there's some quite big farms on here um, in here, um, but even a, one of or two of the, the fairly extensive or big farms had areas of flats which were farmed quite intensively. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that that's that helpful. But they were quite variable, but yeah, as, even within the relatively low stocking rate ones, there were some high stocking density systems like finishing stairs under pivots, for example, mm -hmm. finishing lambs under irrigation. Yeah. And so we've got a question, I think this one might be for you, Jenny. Um, so reference the 28-day interval. Um, was it all about minimising larval contamination? Um, you know, larval contamination on the farm, especially to limit you know, the autumn peak, rather than being focused on lamb wound burdens. So ideally, the you know, the FEC of young lambs should be at a low point um, before drenching. Uh, yeah, sorry if my comments on that were taken out of context. Um, what I was saying with those examples I was giving was that I think on more farms than we realise that 28-day drench interval is still basically a suppressive drench interval and that there isn't, um, that, that, that the 28-day drench interval on its own isn't creating enough refugia in that system. Um, so yes, the 28-day the drench interval absolutely is there to limit autumn contamination, um, but yeah, then in a lot of these systems, a lot of there's not enough refugia, whether that be um, sharing a grazing area with undrenched ewes or whether it be that just the lambs are actually taking a lot longer than we think to become parasitized again. Um, I just think it's an area that needs more monitoring. But yeah, I don't want anyone to take a message away from tonight that Ginny said you shouldn't be drenching at 28 day intervals because on some farms you should. Um, but it just a lot of farms we don't actually know need to go and have a look. Oh, thanks, Jenny. So I've got a final question that's come through from the chat, and then we'll do a bit of a brief wrap up discussion and hopefully finish on time for everybody. It's hard to believe it's gone this quickly. <laughs> um, were there any improvements in drench, drench efficacy in drench on the farms with known drench resistance since reducing their drench input? Very good question. Um, and we don't have that data. So all but one of the farms who had who was primarily driven by the drench resistance that's been diagnosed within the past four years. Um, and we didn't specifically ask that question anyway, but from talking to the farmers, I don't think we'd be able to get that data anyway. Um, I think one felt that he was moving towards better drench efficacy or, you know, felt that he could start to use the triples a bit again sooner or in the future, but that was based on on no, no evidence, I guess. Yep. Thanks, Anne. Um, so in terms of the final question, I'd be keen to have all three of your different perspectives for this one. So if after listening to this women, webinar, uh, farmers are feeling inspired to make changes to their past, their parasite management, what would you recommend as their first three steps? Who would like to kick us off? Um, I'll, I'll kick off on the basis of, of, of what we learned from the study. I guess um, Firstly, I hope that some people are feeling motivated to reduce their direct inputs. Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is, you know, it requires some mental energy and, and a commitment to, to sort of think about it. So I'd say, you know, either talk to your better advisor or do some research and just really think about the management changes that might be required to facilitate that reduction. And I guess also thinking about, you know, what is my drench use? Where could I potentially start reducing? Um, for me personally, I think a lot of, there's a lot of, drench inputs that go into adult use in New Zealand that probably are not really necessary. Um, I do think adult use is, is probably a fairly easy place to start if you're drenching use re routinely. Um, again, just, you know, well-fed, and I'm going to emphasise the well-fed again, well-fed adult use, they just shouldn't really need, need drenching. So that's probably a really good place to start. Um, you know, and if we're thinking about reducing in young sheep, um, so I'm focusing on sheep rather than cattle here, but think about young sheep. I think Ginny talked really nicely about the monitoring um, for a start, just to get a feel for what's actually happening in those systems, you know, what's happening with parasites within the lambs, um, and then get some confidence and some skills to say, hey, actually, yeah, I don't actually need to be, you know, maybe I can dial it back a little bit. All right, I'll pass on to you, um, Ginny. Sure. Um, and yeah, I guess I totally agree with everything Anne said. 
Um, but in uh, sort of in terms of some practical and um, sort of operational things um, to do, uh, one e one really easy thing to start doing just to get a feel for that lamb situation is next time your lambs are in for a drench, drench them anyway, but take a faecal egg count at the same time. Um, you know, if, if the egg counts are really high and, and all over the place, well, um, you know, great, they needed a drench. But if they're really low, um, you know, that's a, a place to start thinking and discussing um, what, what could be done different. Um, that's also a really good piece of information to have. You've taken a faecal egg count the day that you did your um, drench. You can then take another one 10 days later and make sure the jolly thing worked, right? Um, because if you're, you know, this isn't quite on the topic, but, you know, if when you are drenching, you're leaving 30% of the worms behind, and then, you know, if you've only got 70% efficacy of matrix, which may be the case, um, you know, then the next one, you leave those ones behind plus another 30%. By the end of the summer, you've got a lot of worms sitting there that your 28-day drenching was supposed to control and hasn't. Um, so that's a nice just operational thing. And then with your with your ewes, um, it's it's identifying your tops, your, your middles, and your tails. Um, certainly with faecal egg counting, those girls, um, you know, getting faecal egg counts from the the top ones and the tail, they'll often, even though Dave Lethwick will, will be waving a flaming torch at me and saying that it's not true. <laughs> That typically those tail ewes will have a lower egg, uh, mean a higher egg count. Um, and also the two deaths. Um, because yeah, as Anne says, you know, there's a lot of blanket drenching of ewes that goes on that probably doesn't need to. Um, so that's some parasite monitoring. But the other thing is body condition scoring. If you do nothing else with your ewes other than body condition scoring, if you keep doing it and you find that every time you do it, you've got all these light ewes, you're going to make some changes because you're going to get sick of it. So even if that's the one thing you do, that would be my pick. Well, it helps if I unmute myself, doesn't it? <laughs> Karen, have you got some thoughts as well? Uh, uh, everything that Jenny and Anne said. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it looks like we're fairly well on time, which is fabulous. Um, I think Olivia is going to post a couple of questions in the chat um, for people, people to provide us some feedback with. Um, essentially, we'd, we'd love to get some feedback in terms of, you know, whether or not you enjoyed uh, the format tonight from the perspective of having, you know, a short presentation, then a panel discussion, followed by the Q&A session. Um, also keen for um, any suggestions of other topics that don't necessarily need to be uh, parasite related. It could be around some of the other R&D that we've got in the beef and lamb uh, portfolio as well. Um, but I think at that note, I will thank all of our speakers um, for providing us with some uh, amazing uh, food for thought this evening. And thank you to everybody who's joined the webinar. Um, hopefully you've got a lot out of it and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks very much, everybody.